Good evening to you all. Unfortunately, I have to come to you from a screen today. I'm actually in the other building at Parish Council right now. It just works out that this is something that's more easily recordable, of course, than a Parish Council discussion. So, uh, but it's the same talk I would have given if I were in the Parish Hall with you at the moment. So don't worry, you're not missing out on anything. Same thing you would have heard if I were actually in the room. If we haven't taken roll yet, would someone please pause this video and go ahead and take roll so we can be consistent with keeping up with uh, who is at class and make sure we do that part right. Okay, uh, let's pray. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Lord, we give you glory once again for the opportunity to come into your presence, to learn, to receive, uh, to trust in your Holy Spirit, to guide us and nurture us, and to give us the path to you. Open our hearts and minds to know, understand, and love you as our God, and so be happy in this life and in the next. We ask this through Christ our Lord. Amen. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. St. Eugene, pray for us. Blessed Stanley Rother, pray for us. So, uh, as often at the beginning of the year, we have to start with some more, some more practical things. Uh, I want to clarify a little bit about the expectation of weekly contributions. Uh, some might have, been take, might have been taken aback by that, that we are uh, very strongly uh, insisting that uh, you hopefully sign up for online giving, but certainly that you're making some kind of contribution to the parish. And I want to just give a little bit of more uh, meat to that and maybe some clarifications of what we're not saying. So let's start with the catechism. Always a great place. The catechism is kind of one of the foundational documents of the church. So you can rely on everything that it's said there. It's, what the, it's, what the, it's the mind of the church, basically. So catechism 2043 says, The faithful are obliged to assist with the material needs of the church, each according to his own ability. Again, the faithful are obliged to assist with the material needs of the church, each according to his own ability. We all, not just you in RE class, but everybody in the church has a moral obligation to support the works of the church. Yeah, the gospel is free, it doesn't cost any money, but like we have a building and stuff and lights to keep on and, and you know, staff to pay. We need material things, we need mostly financial resources to get that done. So we do insist that everyone desiring to receive the sacraments participate in giving to the church in the same way that we, that we ask everyone to participate in giving to the church. Everyone who's coming to Sunday Mass needs to be giving in some way. Because both it's the right thing to do and it's the precept of both God and his church. Again, we're asking you specifically because we're, you we're, you're in front of us in RE, you're, you're making sure we're, we're registered and doing attendance. But this applies to everybody in the parish, that everyone has an obligation to support the works of the church. So we're not just picking on you all in class. You're just the ones that we have sort of the opportunity to talk to about this the most. Again, I tell everyone in the pews the same thing. But there's also a very practical element that running an RE program takes resources. Uh, I did a little bit of math this afternoon uh, to be very plainly practical. Every Wednesday of class costs us about 15 to 20 man hours of office work. So if you include you know, hourly wages, salaries of those that it takes, plus materials, utilities, various other stuff, it costs about three to $400 every time we have Wednesday class. So it's not fair, really, to expect to show up and have everything provided for free all the time without being willing to make at least some contribution. I think that's a pretty reasonable thing to ask, that it costs, you know, there is a cost associated with having RE classes. It's not unreasonable to expect that there's um, some means to make that possible. Now, by insisting on regular giving, especially online giving, we get to tackle kind of a few problems at once, actually. A little thought experiment, or kind of the reality. If we just charge you to have your kids in RE class, which, which has been done in the past, if we just said, okay, it's you know, 500 bucks for your kid to be in confirmation class, that would give the impression, understandably so, that you were paying to receive a sacrament, which is not true. The grace of God is free. You're not, you're not paying to receive a sacrament. But it would also perpetuate the issue of people just sort of arriving for sacraments class doing their due, and then leaving once the sacrament is received. It, you know, if we say it costs this much to be confirmed for First Communion, 
for class, well then that really perpetuates a sort of service mentality. You, I give you money and you give me a thing, but that's not what we're about. That's not what we're about at all. So by instead directing all of us to the thing that, well, we all ought to be doing anyways, again, the expectation for regular giving is for everyone in the parish. When we, when we do that way, uh, especially the, then we separated it from that temptation, like, oh, it's just like a service for a good provided. We symbolically point beyond the classroom. We say, okay, now when we ask you to give every weekend as a, as a family activity, if you will, we're pointing beyond just this confirmation period time. We're wanting everyone to be active members of the wider parish. And doing it this way points to that. Finally, again, super practical, online giving is so much better from a budgeting and workload perspective. When you give online versus giving you know, in just envelopes, it smooths out the, the peaks and valleys of contributions, leads to, greater, leads to greater overall contributions, and simplifies paperwork, which makes the office more streamlined and efficient, which means we can do spend more time on ministry stuff and less time shuffling papers. So that's why we insist that everyone make some kind of contribution, preferably via online giving, primarily because it's worthy and it's just the right thing to do. And as Christians, we are in fact expected to do so, but it's also very helpful for the parish. Now, we do insist that everyone gives something, but I don't know your family's financial situation, your, your capability, and I kind of don't want to know. I don't, I don't want to sit down and say, well, all right, you make this much money, so you ought to be giving this much. I, I don't want to do that. Now, if you want to talk about that, we, I'm more than happy to, obviously. Father, you ought, you know, can you guide me on what to give to the parish? Happily, I'll be glad to help. But you know, honestly, maybe five bucks a week is really all you can do. Okay, that's fine. Maybe you can do 50 or 500. Awesome. For everyone to be doing something is more important than exactly how much it is. No one will be turned away from a sacrament because they do not give a certain amount of money. Again, no one will be turned away because they don't give a certain amount of money in a certain way. But we do say, I think fairly, that it is an expectation that your family contributes something because you're, I mean, receiving a lot, even things that just you know cost money to do. And it's the right thing to do. But it's both for your own good, because that we, we gain spiritual graces by giving to the church, and for the good of the parish. So I hope that clarifies. You know, we're, not, we're not trying to be just be, you know, we're, we're definitely not saying that your sacraments cost money. We're not saying that, that if you can't do it exactly this way, you can't get, you know, you can't, can't receive First Communion. But we are being transparent about what our needs are and what the expectations both of the parish and of the church are. And again, I know life is difficult and messy sometimes. If you have any questions or concerns or, you know, we, we can't right now or this is an issue, please come talk to me. Again, I'm not, I'm not trying to be, you know, just stone-faced about it, but these are the expectations. But I'm also happy to talk about it if something is, is difficult in your situation. Last week, we spoke on the sacraments of confirmation and the call to holiness. We said that by the sacrament of confirmation, the baptized are more perfectly bound to the church and are enriched with a special strength of the Holy Spirit. We said it roots us more deeply in divine filiation, makes us sons and daughters of God sort of more completely. We, we cry out, Abba, Father, all the more powerfully. It unites us more firmly to Christ, increases the gift of the Holy Spirit within us. It renders our bond with the church more perfect and gives us a special strength of the Holy Spirit to spread and defend the faith by word and action as witnesses of Christ, to confess the name of Christ boldly and never be ashamed of the cross. Again, that's all catechism stuff. But basically, confirmation takes our baptism and completes it, gives us all the things that God desires for us to have. Now, as always with sacraments, it's up to us to put it into practice, right? Being confirmed doesn't make you a saint overnight. You still have to, you have the tools you have to actually use the tools, right? But that's what confirmation does. It takes our baptismal grace and finishes it out the rest of the way. You know, like you could have a house with walls and frames, but there's no like furniture and decorations and it's not livable yet inside. Confirmation kind of does that. It takes what we already have, which is good and necessary, you know, it's a basic shelter, 
and makes it into a fully finished house, fully finished spiritual house, if you will. But why should we care about deepening the grace of uh, received at baptism? Why should we, you know, why should confirmation matter? Because the other topic from last week, the call to holiness. We are all called to holiness because God is holy and he made us to be in relationship with him. So he calls us to be holy because he is holy and we have relationship with him when we are holy. And the sacraments of the church direct us by their grace to that holiness. They give, they give grace to us. They conform our lives to the holiness of God. The sacraments make us more like him. And it makes us happy to be more like God. Holiness makes us happy because we grow close to the one who created us for happiness. We get close to the way that, that we effectively should have been before the fall, before sin came into the world. The grace of the sacraments gets us back to that direction. I talked about a confession at Mass this last weekend. Going to confession restores us to our original state, if you will, not before original sin, but rather to our you know, sort of post-baptized state where we're, we're washed clean of sins again. So that is one more of the sacraments that restores our relationship with the Lord and gets us back to way, the way he intended us to be. And we're all called to be holy. Once again, there's what's called the universal call to holiness. No one gets to say, well, you know, that's just for, you know, for priests and nuns and bishops. They get to be holy. You know, all the, those saint people. But I just have to, you know, be miserable and slog through life and, you know, just sin a bunch. No, you don't have to. We're all called to holiness. Not just you, not just them or them or that person over there. You, you watching this are called to holiness. Same as all the saints. Same as every priest and nun and bishop and whatever. We are all called to holiness. Christ came and gave his life on the cross for all of us. But all this talk about sacraments and holiness is presupposed by one incredibly important fact. The fact that God exists. If God doesn't exist, well, then none of this makes any sense, right? If God doesn't exist, all of this is a complete waste of time. Not just this video or just RE class, but... If God doesn't exist, the Mass, the sacraments, my life as a priest, the fact that we even have you know, a church building at all, if God does not exist, this place might as well be demolished and you know, sold to a developer for apartments, something like that. You know, this might as well go back to being farmland if God doesn't exist because everything we do here would be a waste of time. But if God does exist, then nothing in the world could be more important than prayer and the sacraments and the holy ground that is our sanctuary. Again, if God doesn't exist, none of this matters at all. But if God does exist, it absolutely matters more than anything else there could possibly be. So, we have to wrestle with that question of God's existence and the ways we come to know anything about him at all which is what we call divine revelation. How do we receive the truth from God that he exists? But let's, let's start even before divine revelation specifically. Let's just start with the idea of God. You know, we're, going, we're going freshman philosophy class here. I think the first starting point, the thing that always comes to my mind, is the curious case that even though it's hard to describe, everyone, every culture throughout history has implicitly understood that there is something greater than us. Even modern, secular, atheistic kind of people will still cast around the, the, the I don't know what they say, they all kinds of stuff, because they, they rejected religion and sort of the transcendent, so they're looking for something. But they, they talk in kind of philosophical, poetic, you know, things, things that are just really important and give your life to. And, you know, they're, they're still looking, even though they avoid, they avoid the words, they're still looking for that transcendent beyond sort of lowercase d divine they're looking for things that other people might actually call god and it's so interesting that everybody has that response every culture throughout history has come up with some kind of answer to the question of well what is that thing that's beyond not not is there a thing beyond not not is there some, some mystery or power or whatever you want to call it that's beyond our physical human life. Not does it exist, but it exists, what is it, right? Everyone's had to wrestle with that question. Again, not all jump to calling it God, 
But again, every culture recognizes there's something transcendent. There's something beyond just this regular life. I think that's not to be dismissed. That, that's an important sort of anthropological fact. Uh, we can't just set that aside as if it's some weird quirk of history, like something that almost everyone in every culture for all of time has done. That means something. But I want to be clear, that's not in and of itself a proof of God. It's a, it's a good philosophical observation, but it's not in and of itself a proof of God. There are no 100% proofs of God. There are no 100% proofs of God. And if we look for them, we're going to be disappointed because that's just not how it works. We'll come back to that, though, what we mean by proof. Some people, though, like Thomas Aquinas, have thought of certain ways where we can, sort of thought experiments, if you will, say, okay, like, how can we rationally argue that it seems like there is a God? Again, they're not proofs, because you because the, the, the idea of proof is harder than we think it is. Um, but sort of rational thought experiments, like, okay, let, let's see where this logic goes, and what does that mean about whether there's a God or not? Thomas Aquinas, again, has five ways, and they're in a book that's sitting over there. Just a sec. I'll be back. Look, a book that was over there that I forgot to bring with me. Okay, so again, Thomas Aquinas has the five ways that he uses to sort of think through the idea, does God exist? Okay. One of them, some of them are related, but they're, but they're very interesting to think about. And you've maybe thought about these, but didn't realize you had thought about them. Or now you will. So one of them is the argument from motion. Well, okay, if I, if I don't move this book, if I just sit here, it's not going to move on its own, right? It doesn't have any ability to do its own thing. But if I push on it, then it moves, right? If I move it around, then it moves. Well, nothing in the universe that's not alive has the ability to move itself yet things are moving all the time you know stars and planets swirl around and move and stuff and, there, and there's the whole energy of the big bang that was set in motion to begin with well is there some thing some person who set that in motion like why like there's there's no logical reason that it has to be moving you can imagine a universe full of stuff that just sat there. Just piles of rocks or whatever, and nothing ever moved. Nothing ever changed. It just existed. But the fact that things move, there's, there's energy and, and, and light and heat and clouds move around, and like all these things happen, it implies that there is some force that made them move, the first mover, the one who isn't moved themselves, but it, it provides the motion. Argument from cause. That was number one. Number two, argument from causes. It's similar to the, to the, to the, to the motion one. It backs up even further. It says, well, things exist. They don't have to exist, right? The fact that there is a universe that doesn't have to be, like the, the universe is not self fulfilling. It's not self-descriptory. It's not self-creating. It had to come to exist. Like this, this book and this paper and the carbon and whatever else is made of had to come from somewhere. Again, these are not absolute proofs, but they, they're things that you have to wrestle with and say, well, if I'm going to say there's not a God, well, where did all this stuff come from? The argument from possibility and necessity. This one's, this one's a little harder to imagine. Um, but it's related to at least, at least something like, well, things are put together in a way that they are. There's certain things have been done, like exist the way that they are. Like trees could look totally different, but they look the way that they do. That implies that there's some influence that makes things the way they are. Number four, argument from degrees of perfection. So we can imagine, you know, anything that's a good thing, a better thing, and the best thing, right? You might go to a hardware store and you see, sometimes they do this, where they'll be like, oh, this this piece of this, like, you know, stuff to hang pictures on the wall. Like, here's the, 
the good ones, but here's the better ones, and here's the best one. Of course, the best one's the most expensive, right? Well, if we kept carry that all the way, there has to be, you would think there would be, there's the philosophical idea of, let's say it that way, of a thing that is the best thing. You can always imagine something like, if, you know, you've known many priests maybe in your life. I'm somewhere along that, right? Am I the best priest you know? I don't think so. Uh, is there a better priest than me out there? Definitely. Is there a better priest than that one though? Yeah. Is there someone who's more holy, more powerful, more, well, yeah, eventually, if you follow that chain of logic that there's, that there's going to be, you know, what's the bestest thing, you kind of end up at a definition of what God is. So you say, well, by the logic of, we see there's, dis, there's different qualities of things in this world. If we take that into, into a philosophical and a, and a sort of religious mindset, that implies that there is a highest, best, most perfect thing that we could rightly call God. And finally, there's the argument from governance. It's kind of described similar to what I described before with the, the design one, that the universe is not, it's, it's not, a, not a watch. Some, some people think it's like, oh, it's this finely tuned machine, you know, like it's a mechanical thing. Well, it's not a mechanical thing. You know, my laptop's a mechanical thing. Uh, your car is a mechanical thing. And they have a certain quality to them that obviously implies a designer. Uh, you know, an engineer made your car, or several engineers, lots of them. Um, the world doesn't have that kind of mechanical design to it. You know, our hearts are beautiful things, but they're not a pump, like a sump pump in your basement. Right? They're, they're better than that. More impressive than that, really. Um, but there is a way in which the world does seem to be designed because it's not just arbitrary piles of mush there's something going on there well what is that something or how did that something come about well that's the question that's that's number five of thomas aquinas's five ways there is something that's that's a thing that's going on well how did that happen seems like we could posit that that's god who made it the way that it is but again there is no absolute undeniable proof of God. These are just good reasons to believe. But actually, lest we be disappointed by that, what we usually call science is the same way. We think, oh yes, but scientific proof, like that's, you know, religion doesn't have any of that, but so scientific proof just blows down to the water. Does it really? How often have there been scientific theories that were all like completely true and then we go, you know, actually, mm, there's more we can say about this. We didn't have it quite right. For example, you know, at the beginning, you know, when we first began to build roads and bridges and like simple levers, stuff like that, that was Newtonian physics. You know, you, you push here, you pull that, equal and opposite forces, those sorts of things. You can, get a, you can get a long ways with that, but you can't get everywhere with that. If you look really closely, it begins to break down. And then we realize calculus, calculus was a thing, you know, advanced math. And there's a whole lot more beyond calculus now. And we went, oh, this more complicated version, this more fine-tuned version answers more questions, right? We, we ran into uh, kind of dead ends before, like how do we solve problems that the math didn't seem to do for? It. And then we go, oh, there's this other math that actually that, that solves the problems even better. Uh, or, and then later on we get, there's like how the physical world works. Uh, we thought we all knew, but then Einstein posited things, you know, about what happens with the speed of light and infinite mass and all things, like black holes and things like that. And we had to, once again, readjust and go, okay, we found a niche area where the previous theories didn't explain it all. So now we have to do some more deeper thinking. And even beyond Einstein now, there's more stuff, you know, recent, they're looking for a cosmological model that explains everything from the tiniest, you know, um, fundamental particle of the universe up to the you know, giant massive black holes. I mean, one theory that covers all cases. And we don't have it. So even science, which we tend to think of as just, just absolute cold hard proof, is not. What we tend to regard as proof, both in religion, if we, if we talk uncarefully there, uh, and in science, is not really proof. It's more of what we might call degrees of certainty. So, I think it's very fair and very reasonable to take that kind of starting point. So you know what? We're not looking for proofs because you actually can't have proofs in the way that we think. 
almost nothing that we have any encounter with whatsoever is proof in the way we think. You know, you trust your car will work and you're going to drive home later, but you don't have proof that it will work. Right? You just, you have faith, in fact, that it will work. Okay. I posit, my thought is that if we even got halfway close to applying the sort of logical rigor that we apply to science all the time to religion, we would have no problem believing that God exists whatsoever. Think about it. We have so many, like if, if you could approach, which I wish people would, approach religion neutrally, you know, get it, setting aside all the dumb stuff their uncle told them at family Thanksgiving 15 years ago, or the, the mean thing that someone said to them that, that biased them. You approached Christianity especially from a neutral, you know, you, you didn't know anything. You should think, okay, I'm, I'm going to science this and figure it out. You would have heaps and mountains of evidence of things that point towards God existing. And you, you would have more than you could possibly work with. You would have the Bible. That's huge. This summary of salvation history that we would call it from a kind of sort of a prehistory time all the way up through from from a human standpoint very recent things are archaeologically verifiable you have archaeology itself that backs up so many things that you find in the bible and other stuff too the church itself the fact that the catholic church exists and it's the same thing that existed since the time of since right after the time of christ up until now like there are plenty of things that we believe anthropologically, scientifically, whatever, from societies that long have since stopped, exist, stopped existing. But the Catholic Church is a continuously, verifiably existing organization from 2,000 years ago. And if you count the Judeo, Judeo connection, you know, we're up to like 6,000 years in the past. So that's really strong evidence. Personal experience. That's not everything. But it's not nothing either. Kind of referring to what I was referring, saying earlier, that it's so interesting that every society all throughout history, all around the world, has realized that there is a transcendent something that's beyond just my own sort of day-to-day, -day, you know, grind of work experience. That means something. And it's like verified miracles too. Things like Eucharistic miracles where uh, a, a consecrated host becomes like a piece of actual flesh or things like incorrupt saints, various sort of church type miracles, uh, which many of the recent ones have been sent to scientists and verified to be actually miraculous. So, like, oftentimes we do a lot more science than alleged sort of logical sciencey people who deny religion. Like, yeah, we actually sent the saints' samples, if you will, the, the, the Eucharistic miracle or the incorrupt saints to a scientist without telling them what it was, and they went, you know, this is incredible. Where did you get this? Well, actually, it's from Mass. And they're, very often they become Catholic converts because of it. Another main, you know, so there's, there's that, those big piles of evidence. I want to focus at least a little bit on divine revelation of Scripture itself. Scripture is God speaking to us. Well, how is it God speaking to us? It's hard to describe in a certain way. It's not just a booming bush of heaven that somebody wrote down the whole time. Right, the, the, the scriptural authors of the many different books of the Bible, they were divinely inspired to write what they wrote. And then the church, through the Holy Spirit, discerned what belonged in scripture and what honestly didn't. How did it come about? So there were lots of books of scripture, uh, lots of New Testament ones especially, or from that time period, that then the church determined, you know, this fits with our tradition, this doesn't. Uh, but the Catholic Church in about the 400s settled on the canon of Scripture. What's interesting, though, people sometimes think, well, but why do you have the church whenever you just have the Bible? Like, you don't need the church, you just need the Bible. Just, just read the Bible for everything. You call it sola scriptura, you know, Scripture alone. But here's a problem with that. It's, the Bible clearly does not mean itself to be sola scriptura. It's not the only source of information and it knows that it says the bible says of itself that it is good for teaching and preaching but nowhere at all anywhere does the bible say this book is the only thing that you can rely on in fact most of the new testament especially is paul talking about his experiences of being a minister nowhere does he give a complete systematic here's how the church is you should follow these directions he gives specific directions to specific people, but his whole the whole idea of the Bible existing presumes 
that there are that the church exists and the Bible is just clarifying from a historical standpoint and the spiritual standpoint what the past was like and what we can learn from it. The Bible never itself claims that it's what many people try and use it as. Because God gave us the Bible, but not to be used by itself. He also gave us tradition. He also promised that his church would endure throughout the centuries and would have a long memory and know about how things were and what they're supposed to be. And so we can... We know what's supposed to be in Scripture because we can check it against tradition. Remember, the apostles were around, and, and like people who were taught by the apostles and taught by them were around when the, when the Bible was being decided upon. So whenever they're saying, well, should this belong in Scripture? Well, some say, well, I was taught by a guy who was taught by St. Peter. And we go, oh, wow, you know, that's a pretty good authority. It didn't just come out of nowhere. The Bible actually has very, very, very good, uh, how do I say, um, verifiable authority. So you can trace why we know what's there in a way that is scientifically, if you want to use that term, very, very good. But people reject it just because it's religion and they say, oh, that can't be science. No. If you look at the history and the archaeology and the literary criticism of scripture, it holds up so, so, so well. Okay. I'm running out of time. i got to hurry up a little bit. How do we read scripture? How do we, how do we discern what God is getting at in the scriptures. But why do we have it? So there's a literal sense of scripture that tells us like, here's what happened. You know, Jesus was born of the Virgin Mary in Bethlehem. Awesome. There's a lot of facts in there. Um, not all scripture is just a factual annotation, right? There's a lot that's, especially in the Old Testament, that's what we call religious poetry, right? You get, if you try and take it all as just literal history, you're going to get real confused real quick because it's not, much of it is not written like that. Much of it is written like that though. Uh, so like the gospels, let's just take the gospels. They are literal history in a lot of ways. There's a literal sense to them. But there's also a spiritual sense, which has really three angles to it. I'm going to take a particular uh, thing and sort of apply that analogy to different ways. So the spiritual sense of Scripture, we might think of types. So you have King David in the Old Testament. Allegoric, like literally, King David existed. He, had, he was a king. He did stuff. He had castles and fought battles. Cool. That's the literal history. Allegorically, David rather well, David is a prefiguration of the Christ. Or the other way around, Christ, Jesus is the new David. The moral sense of scripture. So there's so this is the, the spiritual and the spiritual, there's allegorical, moral, and what we call it anagogical. So the the spiritual sense has allegorical, David as Jesus. Moral, well, we see what is, what's a good and a bad way to be a king from David, right? He's often a bad king. He's very often a good king, though, too. So that's the moral sense. We learn morals from David. And then anagogical, the eternal significance. God's promise to maintain David's household speaks of his real desire to preserve the church. So David tells us, his story tells us about God's plan for humanity and his desire to save and protect us. So that's how we can interpret scripture. One of the, some of the ways, um, so there's scriptural interpret. So scripture is a, is a primary way God speaks to us, but also our human experience, also through history, also through kind of philosophy, you might call it like that, where we can reason about God. And most of the reasoning about God, if people would actually reason with it from, with a, with a uh, clear mind and not just say, well, I'm going to just kind of, because it's religion, they would find that it has more proof and pretty convincing proof more than most science does. But often we, we let a little block get in the way there and don't do that. So, if God exists, then everything in the world is less important than our relationship with him. Everything falls short compared to him if he exists. If God exists, which hopefully, hopefully I hope that you believe that he does, then we have a response to him. And that's what prayer is. We respond to God in prayer. That'll have to be next week's topic because we've been going for 35 minutes already and I want to respect your time to make sure you have time to go to the chapel and pray. So even though I'm not in class this evening, I'll be just down one building over and I will see you at benediction uh, for a little bit of prayer time benediction uh, to spend time with the Lord. So thank you all for your attention today. Sorry to be very, by, via video, but uh, yeah, Parish has lots of things to do. So God bless you all and see you in just a few minutes.